Sage Rosenfels here. Thank you for listening to the IO Everywhere Network. This is the Sage Rosenfels Experience. Today, I have on a very, very special guest, one of my childhood idols, Chuck Long. We had a great talk today. Uh, obviously talked about him as the Iowa quarterback and winning championships and being the Big Ten Player of the Year, going to a Rose Bowl, uh, drafted in the NFL, eight years in the NFL, mostly with the Detroit Lions, and and then a long, long coaching career. So wonderful conversation, lots of material covered. Please have a listen. From the Channel Seed Studios, Channel Seed Studios. This, this is the Sage Rosenfels Experience, exclusively on Iowa Everywhere. Channel Seed, seedsmanship at work. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Sage Rosenfels Experience on the Iowa Everywhere Network. Thank you to Channel Seed uh, for sponsoring the show. Today, I have a very special guest on and really special to me uh, because I grew up in eastern Iowa. I grew up in a small town in Maquoka, Iowa. I grew up watching a lot of Hawkeye football, uh, Iowa State and all the NFL and all the other colleges weren't on TV very much. Uh, we got a lot of Hawkeye football and I grew up watching the one and only Chuck Long, and Chuck Long is today's guest. Chuck, thanks for coming on. It's great to be on, Sage. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure. I haven't seen you in a while, and this is a good way to reconnect. Thanks for having me on. It has been a little while. We used to do a show uh, based out of Des Moines, a radio show on Monday nights. I was sort of the Iowa State expert, and you were the Iowa expert, and we would talk about our teams and I didn't really watch much Hawkeye football, so I got a feel for you know what they were doing over there in Iowa City, and and I thought we gave gave pretty good insight. Uh, but really, I think it was our our for me it was a, a chance to sort of work with you and get to know you more. Um, as again, as, as one of my childhood idols, and uh, you know Chuck played at Iowa in the early to mid '80s. I was born in 1978. Uh, so I'm not going to say your age, uh, but I'm 45 years old and, you know, I was right at that sort of age, six, seven, eight years old, when you really start paying attention to what, what's on TV, to sports, you start building your passions. And at that time, probably one of, you know, some of my earlier memories are again, watching Iowa football, watching you uh, over there at Kinnick watching you in the Rose Bowl. And uh, I have two older brothers. And so they, of course, are probably even bigger fans because they were, you know, 10, 12 years old uh, during your run. But uh, let's start, start going back to your to your beginnings. All right. Uh, you, you grew up in, you're born in Norman, Oklahoma, grew up in mm -hmm. Wheaton, Illinois, multi-sport athlete, all right, football, basketball, baseball. What are your thoughts on the sort of the multi-sport athlete in general, you know, in particular, quarterbacks, you've been around quarterbacks your, your whole life. You being a quarterback yourself, uh, you're still around quarterbacks. Uh, uh, what what are your thoughts on the, the sort of the multi-sport athlete and then how the, the, the country, I don't know about the world, but definitely this country has definitely gone to more individualized sports. You focus on one rather than being a three or four sport athlete. I still believe in a multi-sport athlete. I I remember uh, recruiting when I was coaching for Hayden Fry and coaching for Bob Stoops. Uh, those two specifically wanted us to go after multi-sport athletes, not just a, a football player. I think it, it, it's just more well-rounded when you're a multi-sport. You know, you get into different locker rooms. You have to deal with dif different people. And that's really part of it, as you know, Sage, the locker room uh, leadership in the locker room and, and chemistry that you develop. Uh, I think the multi-sport athlete, uh, you know, it works different facets of your game, uh, of your abilities, and you're just, you're around a team all year long. I, I just, it really uh, upsets me that it, it's gone to a focus of one sport only. And now these, co you know, the coaches back in our day never overlapped, you know, they, they, they allowed you to go from one sport to another. Well, now they overlap so much and coaches get upset if you go to another sport and not theirs, et cetera. But I still believe in the multi-sport athlete and you get a much better high school experience when you do that. And yeah. I just think there's a lot of kids now that grow up, look back and they go, why didn't I play more sports? I mean, I should have done it because very, as you know, very few people go on to play college uh, ball, you know, it's, it's 1%. And then, and it's even less than that going to professionally still, because there's a finite number of teams, as you know. So I think a lot of kids re have regret of not playing multi sports in high school. I, I like to see that circle back to that. I, I feel like there's, 
I don't know if it's five reasons, maybe I should write these down sometime of why mm -hmm. being in at least two, if not three, if you can, four in the state of Iowa, they have summer baseball. I chose five my senior year because I was a good tennis player, but I knew I was going to go play football. So like, mm -hmm. well, I need to go off for track. So I sort of simultaneously did tennis and track. Uh, I'm not sure my tennis coach was thrilled about that, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> you know, tennis wasn't paying the bills. Um, but this, you don't get burned out. Mm -hmm. You're always in competition season. That's what I love, right? When you're, if you just play football, the whole off season is, is training and working out, but it's not competition. And there's something about competition, whatever it is, you know, if it's chess that forces your mind to really sort of exert itself, forces your body to exert, exert yourself more than say an off season workout or a, some sort of like a scrimmage open gym or yeah. whatever, you know, it might be. I think also it, it teaches you ways to win. Mm -hmm. There are ways to win in football, right? You can get a lead and sit on it. In tennis, you can't get a lead and sit on it. You have to finish, right? There's there, there's certain things uh, uh, like that. Uh, you know, basketball has different aspects of like offense and defense. You're, you're doing multiple things. Um, baseball, for especially for a quarterback, the, 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 the way to throw the ball in various mm -hmm. ways. And also, if, like if you just play baseball, your arm gets burnt out. You see it all the time. We didn't have people that ruined their arms nearly as much when we were growing up right as these kids do now tommy john surgeries all over the place and one of the last things I, i've always felt as far as like we we play sports because we love them but we mm -hmm. but as a parent this is a like teaching aspect to develop a child into a well-rounded adult whatever that means right and when you're on the football team, you're on football culture. When you're on the basketball team, you're on basketball culture. When you're on the tennis team, you're on tennis culture. Baseball, track, mm -hmm. there are different sort of cultures within those sports. And I feel like for me, being around the tennis guys and also the football guys has impacted me to have like a, a deeper understanding of, of people, uh, of, of how people perform, how they um, respond to maybe criticism or respond to a challenge. And that overall, again, this is just my own experience. I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. I couldn't imagine just being football because I, you know, right. once I left high school, I was in football culture for 17 years right. and it's, it's very unique. Um, and I think it misses elements in like development of, of the human sometimes that can be covered sometimes in other sports or, or other activities, not just sports, you know, um, speech and drama, chorus, bands, anything like that. I, mm -hmm. I think just the, the more exposure you can have, the better for the overall uh, overall individual. Um, so you have extremely successful high school uh, career. Head to the University of Iowa. What were your thoughts during the like recruiting process? Was Iowa the only school or were you like one of these I don't know if they had five stars back in the day, but were you one of these like highly sought after Chicago kids that Michigan and Wisconsin and all the, you know, everyone that gets close to Chicago goes to, were you one of those kids or were you like, you know, a, a lowly recruited kid like myself who got one scholarship offer? Yeah, I have a great, I have a great story. Uh, I, I was like you Sage, I had one offer. So in high school now we had a, we had a very successful uh, team, but we didn't throw the ball. We threw the ball four to five times a game. We were like, some option game, you know, I ran the ball as a quarterback and we threw it four to five times a game. And when we, when we did throw, they were wide open. I, I mean, I couldn't miss. So which, which, which sometimes those are the worst though. When yeah, they're open, the sometimes are they the ones that you do actually. Miss. Right. Right. So I didn't, you know, I got letters, but I didn't get any phone calls or anything like that. In fact, I have a, I have a distinction. We won the state championship when I was a junior. In 1979, we we won it all. Uh, we lost our first game of the year, and then we we rolled all the way through. We had great great rush offense and great defense. I actually set an Illinois state record in that state championship game that'll never be broken. Sage, I threw for minus three yards in that game. <laughs> uh, 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 I don't know what year it was 2006. I was an injury reserve at the Houston Texans. David Carr was our quarterback. We went yeah. to we went to the Oakland Raiders. We won the game with negative yards passing. I watched this <laughs> thing on TV. 
I think David actually had like 50 yards passing, but he had like 60 yard sacks. And in the NFL, that doesn't take away from rushing, takes away from passing yards. So I, I've seen that before. Those are ugly wins. <laughs> I, I was Those are ugly for, wins. I was one for four in, in that game, and I threw a little screen pass for a minus three yard loss. So, yeah. So I, so, but we won the game, we won the state title. Well, Fast forward to my senior year, you know, I was an all state quarterback, but I, again, just not throwing the ball. So, yeah. and, and, uh, I, I go right in a basketball season. So I'll never forget it. I, I got the phone call to change my life forever. So middle of December, move on to basketball, no phone calls. And I, I'll never forget coming home. It was a snowy night. I come home from a basketball practice. I get this phone call from the great Bill Snyder. And Bill Snyder, uh, who went on, went on to Kansas State fame, of course, Hall of Fame coach, um, he was our coordinator at Iowa at the time, and he gives me a call. And he gets me on the phone. I asked him the phone, and he said, is this, is this Chuck Long? And I said, yeah, this is, this is he. Uh, this is Coach – and he's really monotone, Sage. He's, if you've ever talked to him, he goes, uh, this is Coach Bill Snyder at University of Iowa football. And if you're interested, we'd like to bring you in this weekend for an official visit. I thought it was my buddy, Tom. I thought it was Tom playing a joke on me. I said, Tom, is this you? He goes, <laughs> Bill, Bill, without, you know, without, you know, just really even kill said, no, this is not Tom. This is coach Bill Snyder. And we'd like to bring you in. Well, I get off the phone. My father's standing there. Cause I'm the oldest child. We've never been through this before. And uh, my dad's sister, I go, who was that? I said, well, it's this coach from Iowa uh, wants to bring me in this weekend, fly me in for an official visit. And he says, well, are they going to pay for it? <laughs> I said, I said, I think so, dad. Anyway, he, he takes me to the airport. We have, I get picked up at the Cedar Rapids airport by, by the great John Streif, longtime trainer at Iowa. And uh, we go right to Iowa River Power Company in Coralville, you know, to have the biggest prime rib I've ever seen. Well, I'll be honest with you, Sage. I thought they got, they had the wrong guy. I mean, I was like, what am I doing here? You know? I didn't, you know, I didn't throw the ball. I mean, why, why do you want me? You know? So we go through, you know, how the weekends go, you, you know, they, they dine you all weekend. They show you the facilities, the academics, all that kind of thing. And then finally on Sunday morning, back in those days, they did uh, Hayden Fry didn't, and most coaches did not offer a kid until they saw him in person until they got to campus. Well, it's all changed. Now you got to offer kids to get them on campus. By the way, I was probably a two to three star kid at best, maybe somewhere around in there. And so uh, Sunday comes and Hayden Fry had this big, long leather couch. And I sit down and he and he says, Charlie, he called me Charlie. He said, Charlie, we're going to offer you a full ride scholarship to the University of Iowa. And I, I, I didn't know what that meant. I said, what does that mean? He goes, well, we're going to pay for room, board, books, tuition, the whole thing. You don't have to pay a dime. I jumped out of the leather chair. I shook his hand. Like, I want to be a Hawkeye. He said, settle down, son. Go, you go home and talk it over with your family. See if you really want to be a Hawkeye. So I fly home. My dad picks so, me up. So, so this is just you solo on this trip. Yeah, solo, which doesn't happen anymore either. Everybody yeah. goes with parents and all. Yeah, was just everybody went solo back then. So – so I, I fly home. My dad picks me up at the airport at O'Hare Airport. He goes, how'd it go, son? He goes, Dad, I, I think they've offered me a scholarship. He goes, well, what does that mean? I said, well, he said it's going to cover everything, room, board, books, tuition, the whole thing. And without, without missing a beat, he said, have they seen you play, son? <laughs> Do you think my dad, my dad was a very uh, humorous guy? He was really fun to be around. He, he didn't really, he meant that jokingly. I said, I know. Yeah. Well, he goes, I like to talk to Coach Fry. And back then, Coach Fry would always call to make sure you got home okay and all that. So he called that night and got my dad on the phone and explained everything to him. And then my, I'll never forget my dad hanging up the phone and said, oh, son, this is really great. So that was my one and only offer. Now, because of that, Northwestern and Northern Illinois – uh, came in and offered me after that. Obviously, being an in-state kid, they said, well, wait a minute. Why is Iowa offering this kid? We better offer him too. But I knew I wanted to be a Hawkeye. So that's that's how it all went down. And then I signed on signing day to, to be an Iowa Hawkeye. So that is, is Do you fun... think that part of that offer in their mind 
was that you were just a, a winner that was a bigger, strong athlete, right? It's like, so, you know, I, as you know, Iowa and colleges have done this for years. Uh, Iowa recruits all these tight ends end up being a tackle, right? Um, you recruit quarterbacks end up being tight ends. You recruit running backs end up being safeties, right? Do you think there is an aspect that you were, you know, sort of a, a, a just a competitor, uh, state champion, leader, you know, all the other aspects, well, doesn't play quarterback, we'll find a place for him somewhere on the field or, or he'll, we'll develop him into a, a tight end or, or something like that. So is, you know, they're, they're sort of hedging their bets that you'll, you'll, you'll do something for the football team. Yeah. Hay- Hayden liked winners. You hit the nail right on the head. He liked winners and he liked multi-sport athletes. And I was an all conference player in all three baseball, basketball, and football. So he liked that aspect. Now back then Sage, um, they had about they, each team had, you know, there was 95, I think even 105 scholarships to give back then. And so they'd have 30 a year to give. Well, they'd fill their knees with 25 of them. And then they, there was like four or five extra left over that they took chances on. And so I was one of those last scholarship guys that, hey, I, I could see them sitting around the table, you know, in December said, well, who else is out there? that we can go after. And so my name come came up in, in a staff meeting and say, hey, let's take a look at them. I think they put every – back then it was six, 16 millimeter film, you know, reel to reel. So I think they spliced every pass of my year on one reel because there was only like 90 attempts for the year. So they put everything on one reel and just watched me and said, okay, well, he can throw it well enough and uh, he can run around and make some plays. So I think – Multi-sport athlete, uh, he liked winners, and I was at last. Take a chance. Let's take a chance on him. See what happens. I'm so you get to I, you get to Iowa. You don't play right away, right? You, I'm sure in your own mind, you're like, I have a lot of work to do. You know, you're not a pocket, you're a, a polished pocket passer. In Iowa, very much there was no spread. Very traditional under center. Uh, run, play action, you know, a style of offense. Of course, most college teams back in those days had sort of that style of offense, or they ran like the triple option, Oklahoma, Texas, Southwest Conference. Um, and then in your first year of really playing, your first start, Nebraska, to, uh, you know, get killed. Uh, like, you know, I got killed multiple times against Nebraska. That was definitely their glory <laughs> days. Um, it's, I'm sure it's been just as nice for you to see them struggle as it has been for me over the last uh, 15 or 20 years to see the Huskers not doing so well. Um, so you get benched, you get benched after the Nebraska loss, uh, against the Cyclones. And then you, then you get back in, then you get back in and it was your team from there. How'd it feel for one to get beat by Nebraska so badly in your first start. I'm sure you had so many nerves and, and, mm-hmm. and concerns and, you know, you, that you probably didn't sleep much the night before that game. And then you get benched, but then you get another opportunity. Uh, tell me about like those sort of three games and from, from best of from your memory. Yeah. Uh, I got to take you back to my first year though. Uh, when I got there, I didn't know how to read coverages. You know, I, I was like, what's a cover two? You know, yeah, I, I don't know what what was going on. You mentioned, you know, coming into a, a pro style offense, play action, all that. I remember going through my first training camp. I called my mom and dad halfway through. said, I don't I told my dad, I don't know if I can do this. I, it's overwhelming. And he said, just stay with stay the course. You have really good coaches. I ended up you know, being coached by two Hall of Fame coaches and Hayden Fry and Bill Snyder. So I they, they, they were I, I, actually, you know, really good. So I just stayed with it. Well, Fast forward to that spring where I, I earned a job next spring, that next spring. And like you said, I'm going into the season. Now we had a, we had a young team. We just graduated a, a lot of seniors who uh, took us to a Rose Bowl, you know, yeah. in 1981, I didn't play, but uh, that was our Rose Bowl, a Rose Bowl team. Uh, we, the Iowa broke the Ohio state, Michigan curse of the Rose Bowl and, and the first team besides those two teams in 15 years to break through the Rose Bowl. So, and we upset Nebraska 10 to seven in our first game that year, 1981. Well, fast forward to my, I'm starting now. We go into Nebraska with a young team. They had their team coming back. So they had, they had some revenge on the, on their mind. Well, it was my most miserable day as a Hawkeye. We, 
I th- I turned the ball over. I threw balls into the in the ground. I I fumbled the sna- uh, snaps. Uh, it was just it was just miserable. Well, here's a funny story for you. So it was a really hot day. I mean, it was like 120 degrees on the field. If you remember the old AstroTurf sage, you can. It was really hot. You can see waves of heat coming off of it. You know, yeah. And, and it was just smoking hot. So fourth quarter, we're getting beat 42 to nothing. Okay. And uh, I'm still in there, and I've just been sacked. I've been pummeled, and, I, and I'm not feeling good. Well, I call a timeout, and I go to the sideline, and Hayden was livid. He said, what are you doing, Charlie, calling a timeout? Let's get this game over with. Keep the clock running. Well, I proceeded. Now, Hayden wore white pants, white shoes, and a, and a, and a black top. That was his look, even in 120-degree even in heat. Well, I proceeded to throw up all over his white pants and white shoes. I threw up all over him. <laughs> and he, was, he looked down at his pants and shoes, and he said, get this boy out of here. <laughs> so he benched me on the spot. And I think he thought at that moment I might have been a little overwhelmed by uh, the, 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 big, the big game, you know, the college, yeah. the college game. So he benched me the next game against Iowa State. And Iowa State, uh, we we were at home, and we started another quarterback, and uh, we did not win. And so he said, well, let's just go with the young guy. We're 0-2. Let's just go with the young guy. He earned a job in the spring anyway. Let's just go with him and, and, and let, it, let it eat. So we go down to Arizona, another hot night. It was a night game at, at Arizona, 100 degrees at night, you know, that time of year. And they were a good football team. I mean, they had a good uh, – they had Ricky Hundley on their team. who was an All-American. Yeah. Played, played in the NFL. Now um, you're starting to get into some of my, like, NFL coaches, I feel like. You're going to start yeah, throwing some Yeah, he's been a, in coaching a long time. And we went down and we upset him. And I will never forget the elation of our locker room after that, after that uh, game. Uh, it was just a sigh of relief for coaching staff and players and because we were 0-2 going to that game. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we win that game and, and we're off and running. And we end up going uh, 7-4 and that year and going to the Peach Bowl and, and winning that duo 8-4. and So it was a really rebuilding year because we were young, but we ended up going to Peach Bowl and won our first bowl game in about since the 50s. So it was, uh, it was a really uh, special year that way. But those first three games – uh, I'm, I'm glad Hayden stuck with me or put me back in there because you just never know how, what he would have done. But he had a he had he had that gut feeling, I guess, and it all worked out. You and I have that, I guess, similar thing that occurred to us. Uh, as you said, Iowa's first bowl game win since the '50s. For me, at Iowa State, 2000, we win the Inside Dot Com Bowl, right. first bowl win ever, and then first bowl appearance in over 20 years. And so you and I were. Part of it was us, but I, I think you'll agree that a lot of it was the team around us just came together at the right time. And we got to sort of get the benefits uh, uh, of that. And um, it's that that to me is like more special. And Dan McCarney at Iowa State really sold this to us is it's actually more special to sort of turn a program around or do something that no one's ever done before at that school than to like go to Ohio State and win the Big Ten. They win the Big Ten every other year. So like you're not going to be remembered uh, or have a legacy for yourself when 60 Ohio State quarterbacks have won a Big Ten title, you know, over the years or, or whatever it might be. And only so many Iowa quarterbacks have, you know, won a Big Ten title, right? Yep. And and it's that I think that's a special thing uh, about what you accomplished at Iowa. Uh, of, of a lot of things you accomplished. And 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 let, let's sort of shoot forward. So now you're, you're, you have a great year. You're the man. I'm sure your confidence has completely swung. I can do this. You go into your sophomore year, uh, first team all Big Ten. Junior year, first team all Big Ten. Great seasons. Senior year, you decide to come back. Could have gone to the NFL. By the way, junior year, seventh in the Heisman, uh, which is incredible. Senior year, you decide to come back. Could have gone to the pros. You guys have a historic year for Hawkeye football, go out to the Rose Bowl, don't win the Rose Bowl. You get second to Heisman to the great dual sport athlete, Bo Jackson. 
talk to me about your senior year, why you decided to come back, and as that year progressed, how you felt about that whole season. Yeah, well, we, uh, you know, we that season really uh, was, um, you know, coming back that senior year was really easy for me because I knew we had a really good team coming back. Um, if we had all been graduated and you know, graduating together in 1984, I don't know if I would have come back to a young team, who knows, but we had a senior team coming back. I knew, we knew it could be a special year. The, the 1984 season was a kind of a, a good start, rough ending. And then we, we won the freedom bowl, uh, against Texas pretty handily. And we just got hot in that game. And, uh, we felt like, Hey, we need to, we need to come back another year and for a special year. So that's why I did it. I had a chance to graduate at the same time as well. I wanted to get all that done. And so um, coming back for the senior year is a lot of hype, but we knew we had a, a mature team to handle it. And, um, and we had a special big 10 championship type year. Uh, and, and it, you know, we, we just, enjoyed that. And we, you know, we're, we worked hard. We didn't rest on any laurels. Uh, we never, we never slacked off or thought we had things in the bag. So that was really what made it, made it, made it special. And just the fact that, you know, a college ball is Sage, you just wanted to be around the guys another year. Um, pro ball, I felt like was going to be there at some point. And uh, you never knew that. That was always you know, rolling the dice there where you're going to go anyway. You never know where you're going to go. So you knew you, we knew we had something in hand or something special uh, that we could accomplish. And, and I, I always wanted to be a, a Big Ten champion starting quarterback. And, and um, you know, that was, that was a goal of mine uh, when, I, when I got to Iowa. So this was the chance to do it because it didn't happen before that. You know, we went to the Peach Bowl one year, we went to the Gator Bowl, then we went to the Freedom Bowl. Uh, but now we're going to be in the race uh, for a Big Ten championship, and, and we had a chance to do that. So that was the goal, and we accomplished that goal. How did you deal with the pressure, right? Sometimes pressure, a lot of times pressure occurs when there's a lot of ex things expected of you. And going into that senior year, you had played so well the previous three seasons that I imagine there was a ton of pressure that you are going to, uh, you know, whether it's win the Heisman, but win the big 10, go to a huge bowl game, do things that Iowa had never done before. How did you handle that just personally of, of dealing with the pressure, feeling the pressure or um, yeah, how, how did you sort of work through that? Because obviously you played extremely well. You, you, your, your best football, you played your senior. That doesn't always happen. Some people sort of fold in those mm -hmm. situations and, and you excelled. Uh, I, have to, I have to hand it to, to the coaching staff or the coaches that I had and Hayden Fry and Bill Snyder. They just kept me, us, even keel throughout the year. The, you know, uh, downplayed the hype. Hayden was a master at that. Uh, kept us all even keeled, you know, don't read your press clippings, all that kind of thing. Uh, he enjoyed every win. Don't get me wrong. He, he loved winning, but uh, I think those two guys really set the tone or bar offensively of just keeping everybody working hard. Um, I did feel the weight of the program on my shoulders just because you're, you're the starting quarterback, as you know, Sage, I'm sure you felt that as well of, of preparation. Um, but, you know, the old saying, if you're prepared, uh, you know, you, you're going to go into a game confidently. And that's I had great preparation coaches. Bill Snyder was yeah, the best preparation guy I've ever been around. <laughs> you know, it, it took a guy like him to go into Kansas State and did what he did there. Uh, you know, the way he prepared and how he prepared all of us and, and myself. So it started there and it just kept, he kept us uh, even keel all the way throughout the year. And I think that's a credit to being a great coach as they are. Um, I, I did feel it walking across campus. There was a lot of attaboys, you know, <laughs> when you go, go across campus and go into classes and, and stuff like that, there was a lot of fun. I, I just kept it in a fun way and enjoyed the moment because it was a really rare uh, opportunity. I, on campus. I mean, you just can feel the buzz all year long and, and uh, you just, 
you know, you didn't always have that every year. So I, I tried to enjoy the moment and every moment that I was there. You were literally the definition of the big man on campus, I mean, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I did not have that experience. We had a great year, but then I left, right? We graduated the semester and and off I went to my junior year. We were four and seven. I had a good year. I was starting quarterback, but I wasn't like, you know, returning uh, a Heisman Trophy candidate or, or big or Big 12 first team all conference. I hadn't even won anything yet. Just won four games, right? So um, I can Im only imagine how humble you have to be uh, to be really a, literally a celebrity in a, a small town, a uh, small city uh, in Iowa uh, that, you know, loves their football team. Uh, I, I, I don't, I mean, that's, there are, there are celebrities in like international celebrities, right? But they're, you know, celebrities, LA, New York city, whatever it might be. Being a celebrity in a small town, is almost harder because it's it's there's a big world out there and I think a lot of people get caught up in uh, the constant of that boys and hey good luck Chuck or you know whatever it might be and that affects people's uh, ability to to focus ability to compete ability to stay hungry they feel like they sort of a uh, accomplished you know everything they need to accomplish I'm the man uh, but that didn't occur with you um, do you think that humbleness came from you know your your family uh, high school coaches. Uh, what do you think you learned that trait? Because that's a, it's a very important trait. And I feel like it's almost learned uh, or, or taught or, or seen uh, by watching somebody else. Because if it's not, you see those who, who aren't humble and they almost always fail. I learned it from three people. My father, my father was very humble, very humble man. Hey, walk softly, carry a big stick. That's the way he was, you know, Hey, you just, you know, show, don't, don't talk about it. Show, show it. And, and then my high school coach, Jim Rexilius, uh, he was that way. Of course, you know, when you're in a non-throwing offense, that humbles you anyway, right? And then uh, and then Hayden Fry. Hayden Fry always talked about walk softly, carry a big stick. And uh, those three guys really uh, uh, taught me, you know, how to be humble uh, and, and keep working. Because as you know, <laughs> it, it's a very humbling sport. And quarterbacking itself can be very humbling. You're going to have those days where it humbles you real quick. And so that's, I learned it from those three. And, and, and you have to grow up with it in the family. And my dad certainly, I certainly grew up with how to be humble with my dad. And uh, and that's where it all starts, I, I believe, it in the, in the home. So um, it kept me working. And, uh, you know, I had a lot to prove. I, I, I had that, I don't want to say that chip on my shoulder, but I did have a lot to prove. I had a, a high school counselor when I got, when I got recruited <clears throat> and offered by Iowa in high school, I'll never forget my, my high school counselor sitting me down and said, Hey, you, you need to go to Northern Illinois. You're not going to make it in the big 10. It's just, it's going to be too big for you. And, uh, I, he goes, he goes, I suggest you go to Northern Illinois. You'll get a good education. It's a lower level of football. You might succeed there. So I never forgot that. And it was since that is like, I need, I want to prove people wrong here. Cause I knew a lot of people probably were surprised in Wheaton, Illinois, that, that I got a scholarship offered and, and going to Iowa to a big 10 school. And then they were surprised at the career that I had. So I always had this, Hey, I'm going to prove everybody wrong mentality. I'm sure you had the same same thing. You you wanted to prove people wrong, and and you worked hard towards that. Yeah, my story is interesting. You know, I got this one scholarship offer from, from Iowa State, and and it was a, at the time a fairly downtrodden program. Dan McCartney had taken over the team in '95. They won no games in '94. They won, uh, I believe, two or three his first year. Uh, you know, I came in. I, maybe the last scholarship offer they give out. Um, and, uh, you know, right around Christmas time. And, and that, at that time, it was February 2nd was like the official signing day. So I was I was near the end there. Um, yeah, I don't know if I had a chip on my shoulder. I think I was one. I was thrilled to get a scholarship because my older siblings had to pay for college. And I was like, oh, this is great. I get, you know, don't have to have <laughs> student loans and all these things that my parents, I, I had over here at the, the kitchen table, uh, a chance to play in like major college football. Um, but for me, I just, 
I wanted to, and I got there, you know, fourth or fifth on the depth chart my freshman year. And I, at that moment, I said, I, one year, I want to start one year here. Uh, you know, that if I can do that and be a starting quarterback in like major college football, uh, cause I had a long ways to go. Um, I, I thought that was like, that was the, it wasn't to like go to the NFL. It wasn't to win a bowl game per se. It was just to start one year. So the four years of work was going to be worth it. And I, that's, that's how I sort of, I guess, motivated myself of just every day, just keep working, keep working. My freshman year, I wanted to quit. I was running the scout team. I was getting yelled at by our defensive coordinator all the time. He would fire me if I did something wrong or I did something right. He would fire me. He'd literally fire me. You're fired. Go stand over there. Uh, <laughs> And at the end of my freshman year, I really, I walked to one of our coaches, a young uh, graduate assistant, uh, Matt Strait, great safety for, for Iowa State. Um, and uh, he had gotten into coaching and I said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to be a college student like my brothers, you know, go have a good time, go to the, go to the bars or fraternity parties or whatever, and just be like a regular kid. This is miserable. And our team wasn't good. You know, we were low on talent and, and high on effort. That's sort of what we were at the time. But um, I just sort of committed to, I'm going to keep doing this and just keep improving a little bit every day and try to get, you know, slowly chip away, uh, and slowly sort of sharpen my sword and, and make, uh, my skills better. And next thing I knew, I was pretty good. And I, uh, just sort of kept that mindset. And next thing I knew I got drafted in the NFL. I mean, I never, even, that wasn't even a goal of mine at all. It wasn't really a goal as a kid. Yeah. I wanted to be Ryan Sandberg as a kid. I wanted to play for the Chicago Cubs, you know, and hit home runs at Wrigley. Um, or, you know, of course, try to be Michael Jordan and, and play in the NBA. Football was like mm, a little too physical, a little too, this is not really like my mentality, but all the multiple sports, I think I end up being like, well, quarterback is a really a multiple sport type of position, I feel like, uh, on the football field. So I didn't really, don't think like I really had a chip on my shoulder. Um, but I know a lot of athletes who use that as some sort of like, you know, motivation and, you know, Jordan like had a chip on his shoulder. He still has a chip on his shoulder against like Jerry <laughs> Reinsdorf and, uh, and, and, and Kraus or whatever, you know, the, the people who are running the show back in those Bulls era. So some people sort of have that forever as, as their motivation. So you finish up Iowa, you don't win that Rose Bowl, but you have a great season. Uh, you, you get second to Heisman to Bo, the NFL draft coming up. You get drafted first rounder. Um, tell me about that experience of being a first round draft pick to the to, to, to the Detroit Lions, and then you know sort of as you went into that rookie season. Well, I I, I have to say uh, you touched on something, Sage, about goals and wanting to play in the NFL. I never <clears throat> I never had that goal. You know, I was like, I, I just want I was one of those kids. I want to play hard every single day, <clears throat> and you know, let the chips fall where they may just play hard every day. My daughter, my, my dad taught me that just give great effort every day and have fun doing, you know, playing the sport that you're playing. So I never really thought about tomorrow, you know, and when am I going to, you know, I didn't college football came along, Iowa came along. Okay. Yeah, all right. Let's try this. And then all of a sudden, you know, like you said, you just work harder and harder and, and all of a sudden things, things start to click. And, and I didn't really, I wouldn't even think about the NFL. I was just enjoying college football and let's see where this goes. And then all of a sudden I'm in the Heisman trophy race. And I didn't really think about that until I was in the race. And then I enjoyed that part of it. And then all of a sudden I'm in this race with the great Bo Jackson. Incidentally, I always tell people, you know, he won the Heisman trophy, but I'm the better athlete. Let me tell you that. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, he uh, couldn't shoot a bat. He couldn't shoot a basketball like you. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I bet you I can get him in hoops. But so um, I'm in that race. And then all of a sudden, uh, here comes the NFL. I, you know, we're done with the season. I graduated at the same time in December. I had this whole spring to get ready for the draft. And then this is a really good draft story for you. I, I, I retain an agent and – this agent's telling me, hey, you're, you're probably going to be a first-round pick. You know, my family's all on cloud nine, like, oh, my gosh. You know, here's the NFL. And this is really the first time I really thought about it, to be honest with you, because I was always about doing something today or playing today, and, and 
all of a sudden here I am, you know, in this NFL possible first round pick and um, draft comes along and uh, Detroit, Detroit had the, the 12th pick in the draft and the San Diego chargers had the 13th pick hmm. and they had Dan Faust, the great Dan Faust at the time. Well, I didn't really hear from Detroit. I didn't, you know, it was just kind of weird. I didn't really hear from them. And, but San Diego was really interested in me. They flew me out there. Uh, they had the great Ernie Zampezi as their coordinator. I mean, West Coast offense. And I'm thinking, gosh, maybe I'll fall to San Diego, right? Well, we're all sitting around. You know how it is on draft day. You're all sitting around and have your friends around. It's not like the pop and circumstance it is today. You know, we didn't we didn't get invited to New York. You know, Bo Jackson did because he was going to be the number one pick. So he was the only one that got invited to New York. The rest of us, we had to sit around at our at our respective colleges in the, in the dorm room or in the apartment. I, we were in an apartment with all my buddies and family waiting on this draft. Well, pick 11, San Diego calls me and says, hey, if you're there at number 13, we're taking you. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm going to – Southern California, <clears throat> learn from the great Hall of Famer Dan Fouts, the whole nine yards. And uh, my uh, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, she's she's with us. And and <laughs> she says, so Detroit's up, about to come up. She goes, Detroit doesn't need a quarterback, do they? <laughs> so I think <laughs> – so I said, I don't think she so. Jinx, she jinxed you. She jinxed yeah, you. yeah, she jinxed me. So I, I don't think so. Anyway – Next thing you know, Detroit Lions call me up and call and, and pick me up, which I was happy. You know, I was happy with anybody that picked me. And oh, and, you were not. You yeah, wanted to be out there surfing. But, but Sage, you, were gonna, was, you were gonna grow a beard just like Dan. Oh, you, I thought you I was going a... to San Diego. I thought I was going to San Diego. But anyway, it's a twist of fate. You deal with the cars that are dealt, and I dealt them the best way I could. But that's how that's how it all went down uh, on draft day. I feel like if you're uh, like an NFL team, the Detroit Lions, if you do your research and you say, yes, he's from Iowa, but he's from Chicago. Right. And no one from Chicago <laughs> wants to play for the Detroit Lions. They would really <laughs> play for almost any other team, probably. Right. Like, you'd rather play for the Packers than the Lions. Even Chicago, at least they have great tradition right. and you're beloved up there. The Lions are sort of the Lions, you know, and they still are a lot of times with the Lions, right? right? Right. Um, talked about your career, you know, your, your first round pick didn't have a hall of fame career. Uh, uh, didn't have a, a ton of years of starting lasted eight years, roughly, uh, yep. eight years in there, right. three, four years in Detroit out to the LA Rams, uh, the original LA Rams for a year, um, back to Detroit, which, right. uh, one of my old, uh, radio show partners used to talk about a really good backup quarterback as one that has second stints because you didn't burn the bridge the first time they liked you you, you yeah. left for maybe some more money but when that didn't work out you come back and the team's happy to have you that was sort of your career how would you describe uh your nfl career and and did it sort of live up to what you were hoping for uh you know as you're sort of you know, going from college to the pros and what you were you know maybe shooting for uh yeah i was hoping for more you know it started off um you know, my rookie year was uh, – I didn't play much my rookie year till the last two games. My very first start was a Monday night football game against the vaunted Chicago Bear defense. And uh, yeah, I'll so never 80, forget. 87? Uh, it was 1986. And on, it was a sold out, sold out crowd. Sold out crowd in the Silver Dome. 80,000 people. It was a really exciting could, game. Could, I we was go there. Through their, could we go through their defense, right? Mike Singletary. Yeah, I can get I can give Dan, you a lineup. Yeah, Dan yeah. Hampton, Otis Dan Wilson, Hampton. Wilbur Marshall, um, probably Dennis Gentry uh was on that team. Willie um, Galt. Willie Galt, Gary Fensick uh at safety, <clears throat> um, Richard Dent. Don't forget about Richard Dent, Hall of Famer. The fridge, um, the fridge, the, the fridge. I mean, really, like that Bears defense, like the Ravens defense, maybe statistically might have been better in that like 99 season. But I really only can remember a couple guys from that defense, right? You remember like, uh, of course, uh, Ray Lewis and, and Saragusa. And um, right. I believe there's a bullwear on that team. But uh, um, 
that that Bears defense, because I grew up a Bears fan. My dad's from Chicago, too. He's from the north mm-hmm. side, um, which, by the way, when you were going to get drafted, your parents are probably thinking so much for Wheaton, Illinois. We're going to the north suburbs. We're going to be overlooking Lake Michigan. We're going to have right. ourselves a spread. But, uh, I, you know, that doesn't always happen. Right. Um, um, but, yeah, talk to you about playing against that defense uh, as your very first start. Oh, it was, they were rough to watch on film. I mean, they were they were all the front seven is what made that that defense and they were all all pros at some point in time and a few hall of famers in there and and led by singletary in the middle they were you watch film i watch i remember i remember the 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 owner told the head coach at the time Dell rogers hey put the rookie in there our season was going nowhere uh, let's get him in there and they sold out the stadium and all that and i'm watching film all week of these guys i'm going oh my gosh they're, they're putting every quarterback out of the game with hits and, and they didn't protect quarterbacks back then like they do now at the rules and 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 sage it was rough, it was a rough looking defense uh they were just punishing people and yeah so i was nervous going in and and i go into the game i think i got sacked five or six times but i got to tell you this story so my very first uh sack my very first pass play in the game Dan Hampton and, and Richard Dent sacked me. And it, it's like they're at the top of my drop. It's like they were waiting for me at the at the end of my drop. And Dan Hampton picks me up off the ground. I'm thinking, God, what a nice gentleman. You know, the defensive linemen never pick quarterbacks off the ground. Well, he pulls me into him and he says, Hey, look, Long, and I'll save this, I'll save the four-letter words, but he said, Look, Long, we're gonna, we're gonna beat you up all day long, all night long. But don't worry, we do this to everybody. You'll survive. You'll be sore for a while, but you're in for a long night. Is what he told me. <laughs> that was like a, that was like some serious sort of like sarcasm. Yeah, uh, oh yeah. Just yeah. as the beginning the game. They were that the good and that confident, and we ended up losing the game on a last second field goal by Kevin Butler. You know, we they drove that we had them, and uh, they beat us. I think sixteen to thirteen with a last second field goal. So it was a really. Uh, you know, positive effort and went in the next year, a strike year. We had a, a 1987, we, we struck for three games, but I started to get some footing in the NFL. And my, my very first victory as a, as a quarterback was against the Dallas Cowboys at home. So that was a really monumental uh, game for me. Uh, threw for a bunch of yards against Green Bay that year, started to really come on. In 1988, I, I, I threw my arm out. Uh, I, I came into camp, my arm there's something wrong with my arm going into camp. And I, I didn't really know what it was, Sage, but I could not throw the ball like 10 yards. It was just really weird. I, I even had trouble picking up a milk carton out of the fridge. You know, it was that sore. And uh, they, they, they took me out of training camp. I mean, they benched me in training camp or just wanted me to rest it for a couple of weeks. So I missed some preseason games. And I just, there, I, I knew something was wrong. I did something to it. Uh, with all the throwing I did in the off season. And so they rested me. Uh, I, I tried to play the first five or six games. I just couldn't throw the ball like I could, uh, like I normally could. And so they, they, they finally grounded me. They said, Hey, you're just, you know, we're not, we weren't winning. We're off, we were off to a rough start. We had a lot of expectations going into that year based on what we did in eight in 1987, uh, coming off we didn't have a great record in 87 but we knew we had something going and I, I was feeling good as a pro quarterback so they they uh grounded me halfway through 88 and I ended up having Tommy John surgery at the beginning of 1989 in February and so this is my fourth year in the league which as you know it, it it's the end of my contract it's my it's a contract year for me so I went out to Frank Job, if you know that name in California, who performed Tommy John surgery. Uh, he said, you, you're, you need Tommy John surgery. You got ligaments torn off your bone. So I had, uh, uh, and that back then, I think the Tommy John surgeries are a lot better now, obviously through, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of trial and error, et cetera. And I, so in, in February of 89, I had surgery and it, it grounded me a whole year. And he told me, he said, it's going to take you a whole year to recover. Well, as you know, in the NFL, they don't, they don't want to wait for guys. I mean, they have, they have a business and they have to move forward. And they did, they, they ended up uh, drafting guys like uh, Rodney Pete. And then they drafted. um, So I'm going, I'm coming off of 89 without playing hardly anything. 
And here's the 1990 draft, and they drafted Andre Ware. And they had gone from a pro-style offense, which was more suited to me, to a run and shoot. They brought in Mouse Davis and June Jones. You know those two names. And so they they came in with a run and shoot. Yeah, throw it all, all, throw it all the time. Yeah. Throwing it all the time. Right. And, and a lot of rollouts. I mean, it, it wasn't yeah, really was suited sort of to my right. skill set. And, and they knew that. And, and yeah. I'm hurt at the same time. So they, they drafted Andre Ware, who just won a Heisman Trophy from the University of Houston. First round draft pick. And so obviously, hey, I was on I was basically on my way out. And that's when they traded me to L.A. And I just never uh, I got released by L.A. a year later. I was a backup to Jim Everett. And then Detroit picked me back up. As you said, I never burned a bridge. And I understood the situation. I didn't want to leave, but I got traded, came back for three more years, and ended up playing eight years total. But I never regained that that form that I had before uh, coming off the Tommy John. So I, I look at it now as I was lucky to have eight years. I uh, got a pension out of it. I came out of it you know, healthy. Uh, you know, I didn't have all those concussions that a lot of guys have. And, and so I think I'm very thankful for that. Cause as you know, NFL is a rough bet when we play, it was pretty rough. So, um, that's the way I look at it. I had a ch chance to spend some time with, uh, Jim Everett, uh, out yeah. at the Super Bowl this year, uh, in Arizona, I hadn't met him before. I did a little, uh, TV thing with him and he does a little media stuff, but I really enjoyed our conversations. Um, you had a chance to play with Barry Sanders, right? Uh, talking about that experience uh, of you know maybe the greatest make you miss. Run I don't know if he's the best running back in NFL history, but he's definitely the best make you miss highlight reel running back in NFL history. How was it playing with Barry? Uh, greatest, greatest football player I've ever seen. I mean, and, and talk about humble. Barry was the epitome of humble. I mean, he he was brought up the right way. And never spiked the ball when he scored a touchdown. Always handed it to the ref. He was the, he was the general. I mean, he's one of those guys that would walk into the locker room and everybody got quiet because because the star was there. And, and but he never he never bragged about himself. He he, he just knew who he was. He knew he was great. <laughs> he he's been there and done that. You know, one of those guys. But he was the best football player. I, I'll give an example of that. You know when. Um, when he was on the field, everybody for both teams stood up and watched him play. Now that's very rare. As you know, usually if you're the opponent and you're a lineman, offensive lineman on the opponent, when, when Barry's out there or the, or the Detroit lion offense is out there, you're going to be sitting, you know, getting some rest, right. Drinking some water, getting some rest. Nobody wanted to miss the show. So yeah. both, both teams got up and watched this guy play because he didn't want to miss what he could, what he could do. Occasionally you see that uh, like in NFL films, they way they, you know, they'll go back and they'll have audio of guys. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've seen that where uh, offensive players, it's, you know, there's a few minutes left and they're sitting down and then, you know, Tom Brady's in and, and mm -hmm. Tom's down by five points. And I've, you know, you hear them say they get up, they walk up to the side, like, I want to see this. Mm -hmm. I want to see, you know, the greatest quarterback of all time and watch him operate and, it's like they it's like they know what's coming and it doesn't even really bother them that much it's like yep happened to us too the great tom brady uh uh you know put on a show and mm -hmm. and brought the patriots or, or whoever to, you know to victory so uh barry sanders for me you know i grew up watching walter payton um who i thought was the greatest you know running back of all time and then Barry comes along in the same division, different style you know walter just ran you over mm -hmm. uh and then outran you and so physical barry was like the make you miss running back and especially on that turf it was almost mm -hmm. not unfair but you know uh he could make cuts that other people couldn't make or they would basically tear their acl from trying to make the cuts that that barry made uh and he could catch the ball and he could block and he you know he mm -hmm. sort of just did it all and as a, as a small running back and he wasn't like your typical running back right people are looking for big guys you know at least mm -hmm. six foot six one big, strong running backs like Bo Jackson. Barry was not. He was a smaller running back, but so powerful and, and, and so elusive. Yeah, he, he he would have shattered all the records. You know, he, he ended his career prematurely. Uh, he just wanted to retire at, at, in his prime, and he did that. Uh, stayed true to his convictions, and but he would have shattered all the records. I mean, he would have been a 25,000, 
uh, rusher, a yard rusher. Uh, I remember going over to Soldier's Field as a rookie, his rookie year, and he just he tore it up over there on, on a good Chicago Bear defense. And I'll never forget Walter Payton, who you and I grew up with, and I I consider Walter the greatest of all time. Um, just everything he could do. And I remember Walter in the media after the game said, you just saw the greatest running. He's going to be the greatest running back in history. Now everybody said, wow. whoa, you know, that's a big statement for just a rookie, but that's what he said. Incredible. Yeah. So your career ends. Did you know you were done or did the NFL tell you basically you're done because no one signed you? Like, did you want to be done or? Little, here's what happened. I was, uh, we were in uh, Southern California. Um, we, we bought a home in Southern California when I was with the Rams. And even though Detroit picked me back up, we rate, uh, we maintained that home. And so after the Detroit season was over and I was just a backup, but they they were going a different direction with Andre Ware. uh, Eric Kramer was on that team. So I go back to, uh, Southern California. And I didn't know if I was going to get signed. I didn't get any phone calls and there was nothing, you know, usually they call you, Hey, we want to, we want to bring you back and sign you. There was nothing going on. So I'm thinking, well, do I, do I wait to the fall? And, and, you know, I, it, what's, what's really tough and miserable is when you're out of football and during the fall, you wait every Monday, you, you read to get the newspaper every Monday to see what the transactions are and see who got hurt. Cause that's the only way as a quarterback or anybody, you're going to get back in the league. Somebody gets injured and then somebody's going to pick you up. And that's just a miserable feeling all year long. Well, anyway, I've been it, there. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. And so I, I went through a couple of falls that way. And when, when Detroit picked me back up, cause Rodney Pete got hurt. And so they brought me back in 1990. Uh, when Rodney P got hurt. So that's an example of that. Well, anyway, it's February. I'm not getting a call. February, March, not getting a call. Okay, I, do I sit, do I wait till the fall, wait for the phone to ring all year, which I could have done, but it just becomes a long year. And I, I, we have, you know, we have a growing family. We have four kids at the time. And so uh, summertime happens. And this is really unique and very rare. Um, Bob Elliott, who was on Hayden Fry's staff, and you know, you, you knew of Bob, and yeah, and, and well, he, he and he coached uh, my senior year at Iowa State. There you go. And uh, he and I would go to Happy Joe's every Friday, have the pizza buffet. He made me pay. We, we, we were totally, uh, <laughs> totally. I think it was like six ninety nine, um, right, right, and you know, above uh, above the, the table there. But uh, it was Bobby Elliott was wonderful. Yeah. What a what a great guy, a man that just was just made to, I feel like, teach young men uh, to become real men, um, made made me a, made me a better football player. I think made me probably a better person. Thoroughly enjoyed uh, those, I don't know, dozen conversations that we got to have. Uh, at, at Happy Joe's and Ames. So anyway, continue with Bobby Elliott. Well, Bob Elliott, uh, oh, I want to say in May, decides to take he, – he's a coach at the time under Hayden staff. He decides to take uh, the C, he, CEO of a, a University of Iowa Alumni Association. So he, he decides to get out of coaching at that at point in time, and, and, and he wants to be the – you know, the director of the Iowa Alumni Association there on campus. So Hayden has an opening on a staff. Well, in coaching, it's when it's summertime, it's hard to get hire, hire a guy. You know, you're not going to get a guy, a coach from another staff to go with you because there are, you know, the staffs are already set. There, you know, other most of those are, hires are in, in January, February, maybe even right. like even right. December when coaches get fired around Thanksgiving. Right. That's the coaching windows from Thanksgiving till, like you said, maybe February. And then it's all closed up. Well, uh, I actually call Bob Elliott and I say, hey, uh, you know, what do you think about this opening? Who's he going after? I'd like to give it a shot. Now, he was a secondary coach. Right. And I said, do you think he would hire me as a secondary coach? He goes, 
I'll tell you what, Chuck, I'll help you uh, get in this, get in this, on this job, but you got to help me with, uh, with the alumni association. I said, that well, that's an easy deal. And so Bob worked behind the scenes to convince Hayden and Bill Brazier at the time, because Bill Brazier was our D, D coordinator. He didn't want to hire me as a secondary coach. Uh, you know, he's like, well, you know, what are we doing that for? Well, Bob convinced them both to hire me because he told them, Hey, I'll help Chuck, uh, get the, you know, teach him the ins and outs of secondary technique. Cause I knew coverage. We both know coverages. We know how I mean, that, that the, Yeah. That's, that's the thing is like, you know, I, uh, quarterbacks, we don't know everything, but we have a general understanding of everything. Like I, right. I don't know the exact techniques of a defensive lineman, but I know the responsibility. Right. right. I don't know the exact techniques of what a linebacker is looking at, but I definitely know the response. But in, in particular, in the passing game and defensive backs, you really understand their responsibility. Right. But what you need is just like those little details. Like, what is he looking at exactly? Where is his eyes? Probably just to do like the back pedal drills and those types of things is really where you're missing. But those can be taught, you know, really probably in a matter of weeks. Yeah. And. To Bob's credit, he took time. So he convinced them, long long story short, he convinced them to hire me in, in, in the summertime. And I felt like, hey, my career is not going anywhere in the NFL, so I, I, I'm at the end here. I'm going to retire and then take this job because you don't – these coaching jobs are like gold. You don't know when you're going to get them, and they're hard to get into. So Hayden felt confident enough to hire me as a secondary coach. Now, I think – I do think Hayden was at the end of his career, Sage – and I do believe he said, you know, what have I have to lose? I'm at the end of my career anyway. Let's get let's get Charlie going and coaching. You know, if it if it was at the beginning or the middle of his career, probably not. He probably wouldn't have done it. But he was at the end. He thought, you know, let's just get him going here. And and I'm I'm stable in my job. They're not gonna they're not gonna fire him, Hayden Fry, right? So anyway, they bring me in. Bobby Elliott every day came over and, and, and taught me secondary play and technique up until training camp. So I was there all, there all summer, uh, and Bob Elliott taught me secondary play. Well, I was a secondary coach for three years. Now, I got to tell you, on your show, uh, they gave me Eastern Iowa as a recruiting, recruiting uh, area, and i never forget going to see you watch a film of you, and I knew you were a multi-sport athlete, and we loved that, and went back to – Don Patterson was the office coordinator at the time, and and Hayden. I said, "Hey, this this Sage Rosenfels is pretty good now. I mean, he's, he, pro style guy. I mean, you're tall. You're perfect for our offense." And I, I, I and I remember saying, "Well, we have some other quarterbacks. I think it was Matt Sherman at the time, and yeah. and um, and we had some other guys we were going after or whatever." Well, there was a kid from Iowa City who you ended up recruiting that they ended up moving him to safety, but you had a local kid, which is hard to turn. Yeah, we had a local kid, a state but, championship. But I'll never forget saying, hey, hey, th this kid's pretty good now. Well, anyway, we uh, mistakenly did not go after you. <laughs> I'll just say that. And I got to tell your viewership, uh, I was at the beginning of the Iowa domination over Iowa State streak. It started in 1983. So we lost to Iowa State in 81 there. Dwayne Crutchfield ran all over us in 81. Yep. 82, uh, we already talked about that game. We lost at home. Bob Elliott was on that staff, as a matter of fact. And then we went on an 83, 1983 to 1998 streak of beating Iowa State until I'm a coach, secondary coach, until you beat us, I believe, in 1998. So, now, 1998, I was not the starting quarterback. Oh, I was the holder. Todd yeah. Bandauer was a starting quarterback. That's right. You got, but you were on nine, that nine. team. You were on that I was team. on that team. And yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that that was, we think, and I, we, I've we i talked to my college teammates, that's the day that really changed the entire Iowa State yeah. program. Yeah. Now, I think we won three games that year. We won four the next year. Right. But that was really the day that, we can beat these guys. Iowa had been consistently, you know, nine and three or eight and four, or a Rose Bowl right. here and there. And Iowa State hadn't done anything. And the tide and, and Hayden was at the end. Yep. And that was ended up being his last season. We went to Iowa City and and we really did just simply beat the crap out of the Hawkeyes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a physical 
and it was a hot day, you know, right. and I think it was one of the things that felt like we wanted it more. Like they were, you guys were surprised that we were as I, I guess, uh, competitive and fired up as we were. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, that day uh, in Iowa city, 1998, uh, I think whatever Iowa state's doing right now with Matt Campbell, it started in 1998. Oh, in absolutely. Dan McCarney made it an even, even series. And uh, what he did with you guys and beyond, it's just amazing, an amazing coach and, and uh, did it at a place where, you know, it's hard to do. And, uh, and now obviously Matt Campbell's continuing that tradition in a great way and, and uh, learning and learning how to win and getting over that hump is, is, it's a mental thing mostly. And, and it takes time to do, but yeah, I saw the, I saw the beginning of the streak as a player and the end of the streak as a coach. So you're in this business long enough. You're going to see the, that happen. But um, yeah, that's how my coaching career started as a secondary coach. We had some good second, uh, we had some good defensive backs and, and then, um, and then Hayden retired after that 98 season and Kirk Ferris retained me for a year. And then I went on to coach with Bob Stoops at Oklahoma after that. So which was a great call because, yeah. you know, right. one of the things with both coaching or maybe if you're an NFL player and you're like a free agent is when you know a situation's not very good. Uh, as you're 99, Iowa, I think goes one in 10 uh, that season. Correct. Um, real struggle. I mean, a complete start over, right? The, the talent had sort of reduced a little bit over time there at the end of Hayden's career. I don't think he could probably recruit as well. And sort right. of the shine had sort of uh, been rubbed off a little bit of that program. Um, but yeah, when, when, when Kirk came in, it was like, we are, we're, we're starting over, which was Iowa hadn't done in, you know, uh, over 20 years, uh, in that sense. And so you're like, wait a second, I got a buddy down in Norman, Oklahoma, where Norman, Oklahoma, like unlimited funds. They love that football program. Everything in Oklahoma is about football. They just go down to Texas a couple hours away and there's players everywhere and Bob Stoops and you get together and he gets that job. He had come from, I believe Steve Spurrier's defensive coordinator at Florida. That's right. Um, Of course, that's the era of Danny Warfall and before Mm -hmm. that Shane Matthews, but you know, they they won national championships and Heisman trophies and those things. You decide to go to Oklahoma I believe they're about three and eight the year before you guys got there. And you guys immediately turn around and become a national championship football team. Talk to me about that season. Josh Heupel at the helm, Bob Stoops, head coach, and you're also on that staff. Yeah. And I, and I should mention before I talk about that, you know, in 1999, when, when Kirk retained me, I, I really thought, you know, we, again, we had, we had, uh, uh, four kids at the time. We had a fifth on the way. I was ready to settle into Iowa City, you know, indefinitely. Uh, I enjoyed that staff. Uh, I, Ken O'Keefe was the offensive coordinator on that staff. I loved working with Ken. He was great to work for. And so I was really settled in. Now, Bob calls me, um, you know, a year later because he in 1999, he took the job at Oklahoma and actually – had a winning season. That's when they actually turned it around. Went, right. They went, they went seven and five. Now right. Mike, 90, Leach, Mike Leach, they had struggled. That's yeah, right. Mike Leach was the offensive coordinator in '99. Well, he took the Texas Tech head coaching job the a year later. That's what opened up that position. Um, and so Bob, kind of a funny story. I I just got inducted in the College Football Hall of Fame, and in '99, so we had a big dinner at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City. That's when they that's where they did the Hall of Fame induction. So I went out there for the Hall of Fame. Well, Bob Stoops was out there because uh, there was an Oklahoma player uh, that got in the Hall of Fame as well. So he they 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 went out there. Well, Bob, you know I, I saw Bob there, and Bob, you know Bob, uh, you know he said, well, <laughs> he, he told one of his guys on his staff, he said. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to hire Chuck. I just saw him, you know, why not hire Chuck? So he let me get through the festivities. And then the, like the very next day after the hall of fame, when we all, we all got home, he calls me up. He says, Hey, you want to be my passing game coordinator and uh, quarterback coach? I said, which was an elevation. And I said, yeah, absolutely. So, um, 
and I, I got to tell you the story. I was born in Norman, Oklahoma. My 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 entire side of my family are Oklahomans, and most of my family went to University of Oklahoma. Uh, my my parents did, their parents did, etc. And so I grew up a Boomer Sooner. Even though I grew up in Wheaton, Illinois, I grew up a Boomer Sooner and and uh, watched OU Nebraska every Thanksgiving, as you probably did as well. And um, well, in so, college football, if you grew up in Wheaton, Illinois, uh, Northwestern didn't probably have a great program. No, Illinois no. was like you know basically a different state for people from Chicago, and you know who cares about the the fine Illini? So it makes sense for actually people from kids from Chicago, if you're a college football fan to be a fan of Michigan or Iowa or Ohio state or, or Oklahoma, really anybody, but something that's in state. Yeah. We, so going to Oklahoma was like a dream come true for my parents, especially my father to, to coach at his alma mater. Cause he grew up, he grew up in Norman. I mean, he grew up, went to high school in Norman and went to the university of Oklahoma and in the fifties, when the fifties were Oklahoma was on the top of the college football world with the great Bud Wilkinson. And he loved Barry Switzer, the whole thing. So uh, he wanted Barry Switzer to recruit me out of high school. I said, dad, they, I'm not a wishbone quarterback. That's not going to happen, you know, but anyway, so here I have a chance to go to Oklahoma to coach for Bob Stutes, who is a teammate of mine. It was just, uh, it was really a, a, a a decision, a great decision on my part, and really an easy decision. And so, and to be elevated. Uh, and I, like I said, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about leaving at Iowa at all. I was ready to settle in there, but in coaching you, you, ha when you're moving up the ladder, you have to move out, you know, cause there's only so many jobs. And when they come open, you, if you want to move up, you have to be willing to move out. Well, we go to, we go, I go there in 2000, replace Mike Leach really. And we win the national title in that year and, and Bob's second year and the first year I was there, it just was one of those sage, just one of those lightning in a bottle of years. Everything went right for us. We didn't, we didn't get anybody injured. Uh, and that's a big key. And we had this kind of a, a, a team of no name guys. We only had one guy get drafted in the NFL in the fourth round off of this team. So we had linebacker, a, I, linebacker, I believe. Yeah. Torrance Marshall. That's right. And the re we had three walk on starters. I mean, it's just one of those teams that just had great chemistry. Our quarterback was it was Josh Heupel, who's Gr now the Griffin. Griffin, the running back, was a, Griffin like was a great. sneaky, yeah. good player, had a little NFL career, yeah. but he was perfect in that offense. He was about five, six, right. strong, though, could do a little of everything, and he was a, a great weapon in that offense. And I and I went from a pro-style offense at Iowa to a to a uh, air raid. You know, we were an air raid with Quentin Griffin, like you said. You have a good memory on that. And Josh Heupel led the way, who's now the – University of Tennessee head football coach, but he led the way. He's a great leader for us. And we did everything right. Like I said, nobody got hurt. We got every bounce of the ball and we had great special teams. It just, we knew, we knew we had something special during the course of that year and we won it all. God bless him. But Josh Heupel, uh, I, I still can't believe you guys ran air raid offense with a quarterback who really couldn't throw the ball very well. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I got I got to the Dolphins um, <laughs> when I got drafted by Washington. Josh was a sixth or seventh round draft pick, and this is the 2001 draft by the Miami Dolphins. A year later, I get traded to the Dolphins. They had released Heupel. He never made the team his, his rookie year. And I got there, and he came up in conversation a couple of times and like with Zach Thomas, some defensive guys, and it was like – he, he truly couldn't throw the football. Like, I don't know if he had a bad wrist or I think he did have a bad, I think he hurt his wrist maybe in the championship game or something, but it was like, he would warm up and like not even want to throw. It's like, he was like, cause it was so, it was just coming off bad, you know, like the body just couldn't, he really, really struggled. Um, and even in college, he wasn't like some great throw by, by any means, but he just seemed to always throw it to the right place at the right time with the right touch. And and just rose to the moment. But every like player or coach that I ever have talked to about Josh is the unbelievable leadership. Uh, we could put anything on his plate as far as like, hey, we're going to run this, this, and this. And he executed it to a T. And, you know, even without being a, a great thrower, end up being a, a great quarterback. I believe one, either the Davey O'Brien or the Maxwell a trophy that year when one of the, we had like three, it was, it was Chris Winkie, Drew Brees and Heupel sort of took home the hardware 
uh, uh, that year. Uh, and yeah, you guys won a national championship in an air raid offense with a quarterback that wasn't a great thrower, uh, w- which is simply incredible. Yeah, well, it really was. He was not a great thrower. He did hurt his thumb, and I think that 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 was a lingering injury going in the NFL. But he just was not a great thrower, you know. But what he could do, Sage, he could see the entire field. He was one of those guys that had great vision, sideline to sideline, and you could put anything on him schematic uh, wise and he he'd get it down he just had he grew up in a coaching family his dad was a longtime head coach so he grew up knowing how to study film gr- relentless work ethic he just would work till 10 o'clock at night watching tape I mean he just one of those g- great preparation guys and like I said he just had great vision and knew where to go with the football and and a great leader as well no question um, I've taken a lot of your time, but I want to. I do want to ask you a few more questions. Sure. I want to. I don't want to just skip ahead. You know, at, no, not long good. after that, you're you good. become that you become the head coach at San Diego State. Uh, you're 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 really your only head coaching experience. Um, uh, unsuccessful out there. That was a really really hard program uh, to compete with. Smaller conference. All the kids that were good wanted to go to USC or UCLA or or uh, you know, just other schools, Arizona, Arizona State, old stadium. You're playing in a huge stadium that right. I, know, I know that San Diego State couldn't really fill up. So I'm sure it was a very, very hard place to recruit to. Um, you leave San Diego State, OC at Kansas for a bit. Then you start getting into sort of the XFL world uh, the last few years. Took a break from coaching mm-hmm. um, for, for a long time. Started working with the Iowa games. Uh, for for a number of years and still working with the Iowa games. But just recently, what I'm intrigued about is you're in the XFL. Uh, uh, Talking about like coaching the XFL and, and it's, you know, it's not pro football. It's not college football. uh, It's this in between. um, And you guys right now, conference championship, uh, 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 conference championships, uh, uh, you guys won last week. And you're now going to be in the XFL championship. I'm not sure what do they call it? Just the XFL championship. Uh, but that is next weekend. Tell me where you are. Again, you're with Bob Stoops um, playing for the Arlington team. Tell me where you are with this with this Arlington team and and the XFL and, and just this experience as a whole. Also, like going back and, and working with Bob Stoops. Yeah, football leads you down an interesting path. I know you've had your path in football. You never know where you're going to be. And and uh, that's the beauty of it. And, you know, uh, so – my San Diego State years, we only had three there, uh, and um, and then we had two at Kansas. So uh, I was I've been at both ends of it. Where I've been at the pinnacle at Oklahoma. Okay, now I'm at the other other end with uh, San Diego State and and Kansas. I remember Hayden Hayden telling me a long time ago when I got into coaching, you know, he made sure he sat me down and said, "Hey, now coaching's not everything you think it is." And chances are, if you stay in it long enough, you're going to be fired, uh, just so you know that. And so he was really good about explaining the, the business. And sure enough, uh, I, I was fired. <laughs> so, um, but uh, it, it, you know, there is that saying, "Hey, when a door closes, another one opens." So when I did get let go uh, at Kansas, um, the Big Ten Network came calling. So it, that opened the door for me to be an analyst and an announcer for big 10 football games, which enabled me to keep my toe in it, as they say. So I, I learned and saw a lot of football as an analyst. I saw what every team was doing, doing except for one team. So, you know, it allowed me to keep up with today's football, so to speak, which enabled me to be hireable by Bob Stoops in the XFL. You know, he, he knew that, Oh, you know, Chuck has stayed in football. I, we work together at Oklahoma. You also know this, Sage, uh, you're going to go with people that know you or have worked with you before. It's, it's definitely a relationship business. You may not, you may know all the football in the world, but if you don't have a relationship with certain head coaches, they're not going to hire you. They're going to hire who they have worked with before. Well, because of how I worked with Bob before and keeping my toe in it with the Big Ten Network enabled him you know, to justify hiring me in the XFL. Uh, as you mentioned, I, I'm still the CEO and executive director of the Iowa Sports Foundation. I'm, 
I've been at that for eight years. I'm very proud of it it's, and, and we'll continue on and, and uh, keep doing great things for uh, in the state of Iowa. But uh, I am currently in, in Arlington right now until for one more game in the championship game, we play May 13th at 7 PM on ABC and we play uh, the DC defenders from Washington, DC. Uh, what's very unique about this game and I'm very proud of it is I've coached both quarter starting quarterbacks in this game. I'm currently coaching Luis Perez, who's been a, uh, a great addition to our team like four weeks ago and has really elevated our team in a best preparation guy I've ever been around Sage. Unbelievable preparation. Really happy for his success in a short amount of time. And then Jordan Tamu is the starting quarterback for DC and we coached him when I was with St. Louis, the St. Louis Battlehawks in 2020 with head coach Jonathan Hayes. So it's really a cool and you know the football world. It's a small world and here we are crossing paths again uh and now i'm i'm part of a game with you know coach both starting quarterbacks and we're being we're going to be in san antonio may 13th trying to win a championship and then i'll return to iowa after that and go back and and you know resume my ceo job and and get around to the great folks of Iowa and, and try to raise some money. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, one, I looking forward to watching this game. Uh, I watched, uh, some of your game, the conference championship last weekend. Uh, you're right. Perez played extremely well. You can tell he's a magnetic type of quarterback, a, a player that other players and coaches really like. Um, and he's a guy that seems to just sort of rise, uh, to the occasion. Um, so good luck to you uh, in the in the championship. Um, I think everyone is sort of fascinated by the XFL or the USFL. Uh, these sort of you know no one the, these minor league leagues haven't quite worked out yet, but this one really has a heck of a chance. Uh, is and um, it seems like so far it's been a very successful season for 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 those leagues, uh, in particular the XFL. Um, I got a, a a text from you. An email and a text from you a couple of weeks ago about a charity event. Correct. Um, that's going to happen. Uh, um, you invited me to Okaboji, which is hard to turn down. Um, <laughs> I'm going to meet you there. I believe it was like June 23rd, uh, somewhere like that. Tell me about this charity event, uh, what it's for, and what we'll be doing in Okaboji in the middle of summer. Well, I've been part of the Children's Therapy Center of, of the Quad Cities for, for 26 years now. And um, they came to me 26 years ago when I was a coach at Iowa and said, hey, you want to put your name behind this, uh, this, this therapy center? And we'd like to get an auction uh, and your name started. So it's, it's a Chuck Long charity auction of the, of, the, of the Children's Therapy Center of the Quad Cities. And we raise money for uh, we provide physical, occupational, speech and feeding therapy to kids with disabilities and delays throughout eastern Iowa and western Illinois. And it's been around since 1949. Wow. I've been a part of it since uh, since 95. So 1995. And we don't turn any families away that have kids with disabilities and need need service or need help or need therapy. We don't turn anybody away. Uh, regardless of their financial situation. And we're very proud of that. Well, unable to do that, we have to fundraise, obviously. So this auction in, in my name that that um, been around for 26 years started small. Now it's grown pretty big. And and uh, this is what we're raising money for is for, for these kids. And we're so happy, Sage, you're going to be a part of it. Uh, you're a name. You're going to bring people to the name. Well, we started this Okaboji experience last year uh, through some contacts there. For the first year and so last year we had we had myself we had jonathan hayes we had tavian banks and tim dwight we kept it a, a hawkeye flavor well this year we've expanded to corn huskers and and cyclones such as yourself and we have tommy frazier and eric crouch uh coming for nebraska so we have this great okaboji experience and it's basically golf and a party with some uh, boosters and alumni from all those schools, because everybody, you know, Iowa Staters and Cornhuskers and the Hawkeyes have homes there. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a melting pot there at Okaboji, yeah. as you know. So 
we're going to have a, a nice golf experience. And I know you're a great golfer and we're going to have a party that night just to raise some money, raise some money for the Children's Therapy Center. So I want to thank you, Sage, for being a part of it, for agreeing to be a part of it. And uh, you're going to have a lot of fun and uh, we're going to raise some money in, in, in the process. But we have it's going to be part of a uh, it's really part of a bidding. We have an online bidding that starts uh May 10th through May 20th. It's a 10 day bidding and we have over 200 items to bid on. Um, and it's, uh, this is one item to bid on and you can go to, uh, you can go to the, uh, CTC, uh, QC.com. I want to make sure I get that website correct for you. Um, Q, uh, C, tcqc.com and you'll be able to see the fundraiser uh, on that and if you want to go to um, oh i'm sorry ctcqc.org let me correct that uh, www.ctcqc.org and that's where the auction bidding link is for anybody uh, that's watching the show wants to wants to bid on items now these items sage we have iowa state items we have hawkeye items we have uh, NFL items. It's just not, you know, there's a wide variety of items. To, we have guitars signed by people. I know you like music. Uh, we have, you know, we have experiences. We have homes that people give us in Florida and, and on the East Coast, and and they, they can bid on that. Uh, we have wine baskets, all kinds of different baskets you can bid on. There's over 200 items, so it's really a really fun deal. So, uh, starts May 10th, goes to May 20th, and one of the items is this Okaboji experience, and we'll find out who will be the, be the winning bidders, and, and they'll, we'll invite them as well, obviously. Well, I sincerely appreciate uh, the invite. I would love to if we could include some sort of throwing, football throwing competition uh, within that, mostly we'll because have that. I, we will have I know, I know Crouch uh, here in Omaha. He can't throw for crap, and Tommy Frazier, he never threw the ball at Nebraska either, and <laughs> I'm younger than you, so I, I'm hoping that I can throw it uh, better than you. But uh, you know, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe that uh, Tommy John surgery is is uh, uh, brought you back to to life. And and it's funny thing is for me is sometimes I feel like I can throw a little bit better than I could when I was playing because I've actually now studied the throwing motion much more now than, right. than when I was playing. There, the you know, there's actually real science behind how to create maximum velocity, torque, and and accuracy rather than just going out there and doing your best to try to get to your receiver, which is what I did for most of my career. So um, <laughs> I'm really, really looking forward to to that weekend uh, up in Okaboji. And uh, uh, sincerely, Chuck, uh, I really appreciate you coming on this Iowa Everywhere podcast today. Uh, uh, I know a lot, of, a lot of our viewers and listeners, um, you know, grew up watching you play. Um, you're a legend in the state of Iowa, truly. Uh, there's only been so many quarterbacks that have come into this state and gone to Rolls Bowls and gone to four bowl games and first round draft pick. Uh, you are like the standard bearer for any kid that grows up in the state of Iowa of what maybe someday you could accomplish. And uh, it's a real special honor for me uh, for you to come on this show today. Um, I really, really sincerely appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Sage. It's, uh, appreciate the invite to be on today, and and uh, I've followed your career. You're, you've done outstanding community work, and uh, this pleasure to be on today. And looking forward to seeing you in Okaboji's, and we'll we'll throw that football around, play a little golf too. So it'll be a lot of fun. Sounds great. Looking forward. Uh, that that is it for today's show. Uh, thank you for listening to the Sage Rosenfeld's Experience on the Iowa Everywhere Network.